you're listening to TV Club. And for the next half an hour, maybe, we are going to be talking about the second coming of RTD. So you don't have to. Hi, I'm JL. Hi, I'm Dylan. And I'm John. So, <laughs> so when I said the second coming of RTD, that's as in the second coming by RTD. But the reason being because it's the second coming of RTD, clearly. So what I... I th- was it me who suggested this? I can't remember. No, I think it was you, Dylan, suggested this, that we do a sort of short series of Russell T. Davis's back catalogue in preparation for the return of David Tennant and Russell T. Davis and everything else in November. So the way I figured it, what we could do is an episode on Russell T. Davis's stuff before the first Doctor time he was on Doctor Who. And another episode on the stuff that he did between his two stints on Doctor Who, which will be sort of non-homework episodes. In other words, we don't have to watch all the way through hours upon hours upon hours of homework. We will talk about the things that we've seen and we will talk about our feelings about the things that we've seen with that. But having said that, I did think it was important that we should watch something and do a more specific review of something. And well given that it's the second coming of rtd this is the one that screamed out right because this is the one that screamed out when doctor who was coming back in 2005 anyway as the most likely antecedent to it amongst russell t davis's back catalog and i think that became really obvious when you saw it too or when you put the two side by side so let's talk about the second coming first of all let's go around the table find out when we first watched it dylan did you watch it on broadcast or did you catch it afterwards no i absolutely watched it on broadcast and thoroughly enjoyed it at the time uh, and bought it on dvd watched it a few times and then it sat on the shelf for many years and i came back to it about 10 years ago and absolutely hated it and then we'll talk about how i felt about it this time um in a bit that is a very interesting trajectory <clears throat> we'll get into it for me then i didn't see it on broadcast i've said this a few times now i'm sure but during the 90s and the early noughties i after dvd came out and i still only had a vhs recorder and i just wouldn't be recording stuff on vhs to watch afterwards because why would you watch stuff on vhs if you could now watch stuff digital well anyway but i wasn't i was living by myself in a rather expensive flat so my <laughs> disposable income didn't run to pvr or anything like that so i had a period where i would by and large miss a lot of television so i didn't watch the second coming when it was on i picked it up like messiah like white chapel in hmv in a sale i'm pretty sure on dvd so probably quite cheaply because i don't think i bought it when it came out but sometime thereafter and those things tend to get discounted pretty heavily pretty quickly i think I definitely saw this long before Doctor Who came back, though. I think I probably bought it pretty soon after RTD was announced. Mm. So I think this would have been one of the first things I watched of RTDs, knowing that he was going to be the Doctor Who showrunner. So that was kind of where I came in. And during the sort of next few years, when RTD was in charge of Doctor Who, I probably watched it a couple more times. So this is probably about my fourth time, because I just think this is probably the first time I've seen it since Stephen Moffat took over. So this is my first time to reassess it in the light of, you know, altered expectations of what Doctor Who is and should be. And of course, that is going to form the backbone of this conversation, whether we like it or not, isn't it? How about you, John? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I was uh, what I watched it on broadcast because it's the guy who wrote Queer as Folk. Um, it's Chris Brackleston. It's immediate attention grabbing that they get a drama about you know about religion on ITV, which this century hasn't exactly been renowned for anything outside, you know, say straight procedural dramas or serial killers, etc. Well, it certainly hadn't been then. It was ITV was seen as very dull at the time, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. It, um, I think so, that's something Paul Abbott uh, you said, and he actually picked out the second coming afterwards as well. Um, so I watched it at the time, absolutely loved it. Um, and I can particularly remember one moment where I just what on first broadcast, so before Doctor Who was announced, I just um, what you know, when when he does the miracle at Main Road, Eccleston just gives this manic grin. I just went. Yeah, he'd make a great Doctor Who. 
but there's no <laughs> chance he'll ever do it. There's no chance it's coming back, so it's never going to happen. Um, oh, there you go. Yeah, I think I watch, watched it when RTV was announced. Um, watched it, I think, yeah, about 2010-ish. And then I think when I was writing The Black Archive on Rose, I think I watched it three or four times then for, for obvious reasons as research material. So that's my background with it. Okay, so I'm going to find out where you stand in, as opposed to where Dylan stands. The last time Dylan watched it, he hated it. So, John, have, has your love for it maintained throughout all those viewings? Um, well, I kind of, as a child, I was one of these who was <laughs> forced to go to Sunday school. So I kind of had the religious background to have that interest for me. Yeah, I was um, one of those as well. I, I still like it, um, but I, I think I have the caveats that with Russell T. Davis being a fairly well-known atheist, um, I think it ends in rather an obvious place with a rather an obvious conclusion. I've got to say, watching it this time, watch every time I've watched it, and I think this is going to be probably my sort of thesis for Russell T. Davis in toto across all these episodes we do for him, I think he spins so many things so quickly, he kind of dazzles the viewer into submission such that you are thoroughly entertained while you're watching something. And I think as long as you don't really engage your brain too heavily, which is not to say not at all, there's plenty of substance in his stuff as long as you don't pick at it. But as soon yeah. as you start picking at the substance, I think it really unravels badly. And watching the second come in this time, I was blown away by it for the first episode while I was watching it. And then while I was watching the second episode, I was starting to think, I'm not so sure. And it entertained me to the very end. But in the 46 hours, 45, 46 hours since I finished watching the second episode, I've got to say, it has just irritated me more and more and more <laughs> in those 45 hours thinking about it. And I've got to say, I'm in a pretty bad place with it now, no matter how much it entertained me <laughs> during the course of those two and a half hours while I was watching it two nights ago. So we'll probably pick into that. Dylan, I want to find out how do you feel about it watching it this time? Well, um, I'll, I'll go back to the last time I watched it. Um, and I, I guess that it was literally about 2012, 2013, something like that. Yeah. And I remember watching it with some friends and sort of going, this is one of my favourite dramas. And I think as a piece of drama, it had aged quite badly at that point, just in terms of where modern television had come in the sort of five yeah. or six years. And that, as you say, that second episode really not holding together. So I, re I really came away from it, like, going... And also, uh, we'll get into this, I'm sure, a bit later. I'm not a yeah. huge Christopher Eccleston fan. So oh, okay, yeah. um, I, could, I always find faults in his performance. So I think I found a lot of that. I, I don't see him as a particularly believable actor, uh, despite him being the king of gritty realism or whatever. Um, so coming back to it this time... Do you know what? Just, just on that point, he might be the king of gritty realism, but when you're playing a gritty, realistic northerner, helps if you don't talk like that. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, he's got such a nasal delivery that yeah. kind of undermines his performance a bit, I think. But, 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 <laughs> yeah. Tom, um, I think what I said, um, I think Jim Curry Smith pointed out to me, it was he has he hasn't got much of a range now, but he has kind of a, a depth to it. He has one kind of thing he can play, but he plays yeah. it really well on that point. And that can, that can be a curse and a blessing. I think oh. he looks absolutely perfect for the part as well. Yeah. yeah. The um, Son of God, Christopher Eccleston, you 100% believe it. Yeah, exactly. And coming back to it this time, I both found he, I found both his performance a lot more interesting and believable. And I really loved the, the, the first part. When I sat down to watch this first part, I was like, oh, you know, all is forgiven. Because things sort of age and then they age out of being aged. Yeah, and yeah, they yeah. just be, sort yeah. of become old. Um, so I really loved the first part. There were points of the, in the second part that I really enjoyed. I th think it throws up some nice ideas, but it doesn't stick the landing for me. And that set that second part I found, especially the last sort of five or ten minutes, I found pretty unbearable. Do you know what I think the problem is? And I, I, I preface this by saying I really like the ending of this. Actually, I think the ending 
makes up for a lot of the sort of vagaries that I found in the second episode. But I think the problem is that Russell T. Davis, and this comes from somebody who appreciates how much people appreciate his writing of characters and character drama and all this kind of stuff. I just don't think Russell Davis has any interest in anybody else or anybody else's opinions other than his own. And the second coming, when you boil it down, uh, this is the thing. This is about Jesus Christ or brother of Jesus Christ or whatever you want to call it, son of God, coming to earth. This should throw up some really interesting discussions about the nature of religion, about the nature of having different religions that all essentially believe in the same thing in different ways, about the sort of dichotomy between man and his representation of God mm. and his belief in what God's and all of these other subjects. There are a million things that the second coming could have dug into, could have explored, could have examined, could have discoursed. But it doesn't do any of those things. It just kind of sits Christopher Eccleston down in a room, has him looking moody for 45 minutes, then kills every fucker off. It's very annoying. <laughs> yeah, it, it's a polemic, isn't it? It's it's really yeah. a kind of atheism thing that was around turn of the century. Um, what was it? Christopher Hitchens, Daniel Dennett, um, Richard Dawkins, all that stuff. And it's very much kind of in tune with that. It's a, People want to tell you there is no God. Well, that's fine. You're not, again you are kind of preaching to the converted or whatever the answer Very is. much so, yeah. Yeah. As I mean, it... nobody who, and it, this comes from somebody who's a confirmed atheist, atheist so I completely sort of, I, I completely agree with the sentiment of it, but I just don't think there's any generosity of spirit at all in the way he presents it. The, the, it's like my way or the highway, isn't it? The thing that's missing for me is in that first episode, you've got the priest character and the relationship there, and they have that interesting sort of chat over breakfast. And I'm for like, two scenes. Yeah, he's gone. <laughs> Now, him yeah. being by his side or part of the story all the way and being the voice of religion on Earth would have made for such an interesting conversation. And in the sort of two-hour runtime, maybe you don't have the time to look at the Hindu faith and the Muslim faith and Christian versus Catholic versus all this stuff. But one person... But you could at least have looked at Christian. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what's it there for if it isn't even going to do that? It's <laughs> unbelievable. Sorry. You set me off. <laughs> but 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 that's it. It, it. It's missing. It's missing that sympathetic voice for religion and the sort of a grounded voice for religion as well. Not just isn't religious silly, but religion silly. They believe in a man in the sky and all that stuff. It's like there's 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 something cleverer and smarter to be done with this story yeah, yeah. that that isn't isn't there. So yeah, oh, it just is a kind of thing in the way um, Russell writes characters because he looks for a, a selfish motive as a hook to his characters mm. every and time yeah very much at least the sense be about being giving yourself up something greater than yourself and he i don't quite think he understands that one well he, he kind of ascribes basically essentially the same motives the same characterization and the same faults to all of his characters Yes. And kind of to different levels, I suppose. So you can basically differentiate between them. But in the end, when it comes down to it, he can't seem to give any of his characters something that's not that same motivation. And even when he's writing The Son of God, he still writes him as a selfish bastard, the same as everybody else who's in the story. But look, we'll come back to talk about characters and the actors, I think, in a minute, because uh, maybe that's where we can find a lot of positives here and just to be honest i'm not going to give this a low score i didn't hate it mm. <laughs> i just found the sort of selfishness of it irritating i suppose but then the other thing is watching this now having seen stephen moffat's doctor who and yes even chris chibnall's doctor who because one thing that chris chibnall does know what to do is sort of make a story sort of make sense i think by and large but this doesn't even add up logically. There's a kind of, there's this expression that I'm going to put the light on because neither of you can see me. <laughs> so there you go. I'll no, try and remember to edit that out, but I won't. <laughs> there's this thing that people talk about, which is show and tell. And the whole line, and this is a common criticism thrown at, for instance, Chris Chibnall. And generally speaking, people boil it down to this really simple idea of you don't have to tell them that there's a car coming down the road you show them 
there's a car coming down the road by pointing a camera at it. But I like to think that actually show and tell could be a bit more involved than that. And I like to think that in a coherent, consistent story, what you do is everything that you tell the audience that are watching at home, you prove to them by showing them examples of how that thing works. So if the end of your story is 100% revolving around this really, really solid idea that if you kill the son of God, you are also killing God, then what you don't do is talk about the fact that man also killed Jesus and God lived on. <laughs> so Russell T. Davis is telling the audience one thing, but showing them something else entirely do that I, makes the entire last 15 minutes of this lack any logical sense whatsoever. Does does it kill God or does it just mean God abandons them? I'm trying to remember in the sort I of talking even, heads yeah. thing at the end, whether somebody says that it just meant the day that God left or something like that. I don't know. Mm. It's, uh, But I think, yeah, because they talk about it in different ways, but yeah. I think the idea that we're supposed to get from... Um, think of your character, Leslie Sharp's character, is that she's killed God as well. I think that was the sense I'd taken away from it every time I've watched it. Okay. So I think she alludes to killing God as well, and everybody else interprets that in different ways. But mm. again, but it's I'm kind of a woolly concept, awfully, isn't it? Because awfully simple. Because can you, you know, can you see the American religious right particularly giving up God like that? <laughs> well, that's it. That's the yeah. way it doesn't work. You, she says. She says, and she captures on video, I've killed the son of God. And we're supposed to think that 7 billion people across the planet, many of which are sort of pretty fundamentally religious, 7 billion people just throw their hands up and go, oh, dear. Yeah. Well, it, OK, it, let's it, just get on with it. then. Eh? Back to her old life. That's not going to happen. <laughs> yeah, I, I, quite. I would I would be more interested. You know, it suddenly goes to like a pseudo documentary at the end, which is mm. very jarring. But I I'm sort of interested in a version of this that is part sort of dramatic and part pseudo documentary that has things like that thrown in in the middle and then you yeah. deal with like what happens with the idea of you've killed god and some people go no it's a conspiracy other people go no it's a trick of the devil and things like that so you explore almost the aftermath during the telling of the story a little bit more well this maybe comes down to adrian shergold because he could have i mean he there's no reason he couldn't have thrown more of that in himself right but he was, what, 55 when he made this? So he wasn't ancient. But he had been around in television and even in film, I think, as well. No, maybe not so much in film. He'd been around in television for a fair few years, though. I mean, his his single idea with this is to put a circular track around the actors and just get the camera moving first, <laughs> first clockwise and then anti-clockwise. But it never stops moving around the characters yeah, in a perfect like circle. Yeah, time. <laughs> it is isn't it and it's, after you've watched it for about 45 minutes you're like reaching for the headache tablets he's yeah. probably watched the west wing isn't he? he's trying to kind yeah. of get the people on the moon thing going i mm. think you i think you're at a point in british drama as well where they're desperately trying to keep up with american drama and not able to at that point i don't think it's quite the level playing field that we have now so I, I can see him thinking he's doing something, as you say, that's like the West Wing or like what they do in America. But because it's sort of done in that British way, it just sort of it's very jarring. But that's it, isn't it? Because Britain had this reputation in the 50s, 60s, 70s and probably even into the 80s for doing the world's best sort of high end television. But it was quite stuffy. And when America yeah. started doing stuff that really wasn't stuffy, but was earning a reputation, this is kind of trying to be the halfway house between the stuffy yeah. version and the really not very stuffy version, I yeah, suppose. I, isn't I it? mean, it, it's the end of the point because because British tele telly is very very different from American television because American television obviously uh, spins off out of Hollywood, whereas British television yeah, yeah. spins out of theatre. So that yeah. so that kind of late eighties into the nineties into the early two thousands, it's kind of a mishmash of the approach and it makes some interesting stuff, but it, it's it's messy. It's quite a messy little era. I mean, it's gloriously kinetic, though. It never does stop moving, and it just it keeps you engaged with it throughout. Because there's, because even when your brain is sort of starting to judge her a bit, there's always something that's grabbing your visual attention. So, it, it, and in that respect, it works. But 
oh boy if you actually start thinking about what he's doing it really is all about that circular track isn't it <laughs> but i think that that comes down to what i was saying before about it feeling very dated in 2013 in a way that it doesn't feel dated now because it's just a bit of old television it's, yeah, yeah. it's sort of it, it, it's so of its time that it, you it, you don't so much mark it on its merit of what it's achieving sort of technically also it's a bit like fashion i suppose mm. in fashion you have something that arrives for the first time like say flares and then 20 years later flares will get a resurgence but after they've had the first resurgence after that, they're just something that's kind of there. And yeah. so so you have them, and then you don't have them. But when they come back, they just become part of the overall thing. And I guess television feels a bit like that. It can go through a period where it's things have moved on, but then it just becomes part of the firmament. Yeah, exactly. It's why it's why all the Doctor Who fans are still waiting for uh, multi-camera drama recordings to come back desperately into mm, vogue, waiting dear, for some, <laughs> some young director to go, this is a great way to make something. You listen to far too much Radio Free Scarrow, Dylan. <laughs> <laughs> now, Dylan, while I'm with you, tell me more about Christopher Eccleston. Does he work for you in this? He does, actually, this time round. And to be honest, so... When Doctor Who came back, I'll bring it back to Doctor Who as always, I was really excited that the guy from The Second Coming was cast as Doctor Who. I thought he picked... What I wanted from his Doctor was the character he played in this. And I suppose it is, but heightened. But I've... Mm. I just... There's something about Christopher Eccleston I don't buy in most things. I don't buy his performance in most things. In this... I 100% buy it all. I think it's the most naturalistic, interesting performance I've seen him give in a, in a very long time. So I was, it's just, he's so toned down and he's doing the happy and he's doing slightly bit, bits of eccentricity because he is the normal guy uh, who has discovered he's the son of God. And I'm just like, this is the Christopher Eccleston that everybody tells me is this fantastic performer that I can never find. So I'm really into him here. i have been like 10 out of 10 for his performance easy. The thing about him is you can always see that he's acting, can't you? And that's the problem. If you put a lot of people around, you know, if you cast deliberately to try and make something look natural or authentic or organic, and then you stick somebody in and you can see his performance all the way yeah. through, even if his performance is supposed to be, even if he's doing natural or doing organic or doing authentic, but if you can see he's doing it, that's not the same. I, I think he's also, he's sort of like this generation of actor that's come from the previous generation of actors who were all stage actors. Yeah. And he's sort of the first generation of actor that's been taught by stage actors to act for TV. So yeah. whereas beyond that, by the time you get to the early noughties, the people that are being trained then, they're, it's, it's specifically acting for screen. So he is this weird sort of hybrid gener generation of actors who... They can do the realism, but it, it, it you it's acted realism is the only way I can describe it. It comes yeah. out. It's also his act. You know, he's playing someone of his background and his upbringing and his class, which I yeah. think is kind of plays into his ranks really nicely on this one. And but like, also, I think that's the problem, John. For me, maybe the problem is he is basically playing more or less a version of himself, yeah. but. I think, but I think that's be, that means that the fact that you can see him doing it becomes even more apparent because he's not just being it, he's doing, he's doing a version of himself, if you see what I mean. And you can see him acting, being natural, which is just a sort of weird kind of... And I, that kind of works for this part for me because yeah. once you've discovered the other son of God, He's trying to act natural to, to, as himself. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's a really spot, nice little manic quality to him while he's playing into the Son of God stuff. I mean, like I said, the grin at the end of the main row, it's fabulous. You go, yeah, you can understand why someone would go, "You are the Son of God." At that point, I think I preferred him as Doctor Who, to be frank, because I think the part that he was playing, this person who'd survived this war, and who was sort of almost mortally wounded by it, but was trying to put on a brave face. I think that worked for Eccleston more. So this thing about you can see he's acting, I think works more in the part that he was playing in Doctor Who, especially as he only played it for that one year. 
And of course, when you're playing the doctor, there's so much else that's going on around you. You're not actually the main part at all, are you really? Really, I mean, especially in Russell T. Davis, the companion is just as important. But the story takes up so much of the room that the sort of main two characters are pretty sidelined for a lot of it. Whereas I think here, he's almost in every single scene. He's not quite in everything. I don't know if they, maybe if there's a version of this that might have been better in some ways if he was, if we saw everything from his point of view. But then I guess you'd miss so much. Mm. But I think he's... I think he's got the spotlight on him just slightly too much here to convince in that role as much. Having said that, I don't, I don't fault it. I, uh, it did work for me pretty much. Maybe just not quite as much as you two. There's, uh, there's, there's, it's interesting. I, I don't think it, it would have worked entirely set around him because there's some interesting, the, the reactions of the people around him, obviously Leslie Sharp's character, which I'm sure we'll get into in a bit, but the other sort of his other friends, and you know the, <clears throat> the woman who tries to poison her kids, the guy who asked for like his yeah. sister's daughter to be you know um, cured from whatever illnesses. And there's actually a deleted scene. You know, on the, two the, and a half hours. Why do we only get to see that once? Well, th- there's a deleted scene on the DVD where yeah, he yeah. actually goes. Um, he goes, she's cured. She's not cured. She's cured. She's not cured. And he goes into a oh, bit really? more why yeah. why he, you um, why you wouldn't do that. And it's you know again it, it makes for a more interesting di- dilemma, but they they obviously cut it down to the bare the bare. Do you bones. know well? Do you know why there's so many deleted scenes? Um, it's something to do with it was supposed to, it was two one hours, then it was two ninety minutes, and then it had to be cut down. It was four one hours, and then it was two ninety minutes. Oh. Um, so was, it, it was eight four one hour version. They cut yeah they had to cut it right. Yeah, down. it was originally the idea was that originally it was going to be for Channel Four, and it was going to be for. At, I guess four forty-five minutes. Right. So he wrote four forty-five minutes, and then when Channel Four didn't pick it up, and ITV did, and it was going to be two uh, seventy minutes or whatever. I guess he didn't take as much out of the script as he probably should have done. Right. So they filmed far more than they needed, but that gave them the choice then of what they used in the edit, didn't it? Yeah, yeah, I guess so. But you know, it comes back to the. The reactions of the people around him are sort of, you could do a whole drama just about some of those people if if you wanted to. And I think actually, rather than focusing more on him, I'd like to see more focus on more of the reactions well, that's around it. him and the support characters. This should either, it should either be the story of what everybody makes of him. Or it should be the story of what he makes of what's mm. happening and what he, how he reacts to the reactions of the people. There's a really interesting story to be told about how his character reacts to the reactions of the people around him, both those yeah. in the inner circle and those in ever-widening circles. But you don't really get that either because he just sort of sits in the room. And you don't you get, get to see... Davis thing of the mass media, don't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. So, uh, And that's the point. You get all that thing about the mass media and what it means in the sort of middle distance, but you never get to see further afield and you don't see enough of what's happening close up that you're really quite sold on. So the the woman who tries to kill herself and her kids and who kind of essentially is driven mad by what's happened to one of her best friends from school, you don't see enough of that story to really be convinced by it. And sort of the things that happen to her feel really superficial when they should have a lot of weight behind them. I think you see enough to to sort of sell sell the breakdown. But yeah, there could be more. There could be a lot more. And I wonder if that's the sort of stuff that was lost in the editing, that these sort of subplots suddenly become sort of a little inconsequential because you're you're trying to tell your main story. Mm, Maybe. But I don't think it should have started with him. I think that's the trouble. It kind of presents him. See, that that opening scene presents him as your point of view character. Mm. And then it pulls that rug away and says, no, Leslie Sharp's going to be your point of view character. But then it sort of vacillates over that as well and sort of goes back and forth between the two and some other people as well. I don't know. It kind of it never... See, this is the thing with a lot of Russell T. Davis stuff. Like I say, he keeps it moving so fast you don't notice. But afterwards, you're thinking, well, who was I supposed to care about? Mm. <laughs> yeah, I'll tell you one thing. Go on. I, was gonna say, I, I think 
I think the problem is as well that because you don't get to know enough of the other characters apart from Leslie Sharp. And I'm not actually sure Leslie Sharp's character's likable enough for, no. for you to come out of it at the end and go, oh, poor old Leslie, or but what she's been through, or poor old Christopher Eccleston. What he's I think she's through. really unlikable, frankly, yeah. throughout the whole thing. She's like a real <laughs> she's like a real Karen <laughs> character, really, isn't she? <laughs> <laughs> and so you kind of I don't I didn't feel much sympathy for her at all this time. No, I I think I understand her wanting to find out more and not believing because, you know, if anybody I knew suddenly turned around and said they were the son of God, I I would think they were having some sort of meltdown. But even she just she can't give it up. And it's I'm not saying it's an it's unbelievable, but it does make her unlikable. And I can't get away from that, that that I don't particularly like any of these characters the most the character i've got the most sympathy for is his dad who just seems to have a rough old ride and when he's in prison at the end i'm like oh take him out of prison he was influenced by the devil yeah yeah he gets pushed into things by the devil or the devil's advocates yeah and it's not his fault so how come there's no sort of redemption story for him plus i don't this whole thing of making him sterile that was utterly unnecessary and i sort of understand that Davis is using that to push him into the act, but it's felt like a really bloody minded shortcut that didn't need to. I mean, I was just kind of like, Oh, you manipulative sod. And I didn't, it didn't have the ring of truth of it at all because I mean, (laughs) these are the kind of things that for a character to be finding out things of this import at his age, just it just didn't have the ring of truth about it. Yeah, and it, the whole it's quick logic, plot logic, isn't it? That you need in, in a Russell T Davies script to keep things moving. It's it will sound superficially fine, and then it's a shortcut. Yeah, but you get past it so quick. It's only like four viewings down the line where you're thinking, "Well, God, that doesn't work." <laughs> it, it was also the throwaway throwaway line about the mother sort of always seeing things and being a bit weird and stuff like that. And it's like, well. You would you would remember enough to go. She was like, "Oh yeah, well, she kept having visions of God or something like that." There's a difference between seeing things and it being a shadowy man in the corner and angels or God or something like that. Or she might have yeah. said, "Oh, but uh, I, I'm carrying the Son of God, perhaps, or something." Like it, it's it, that that bit sort of stretches credibility as well. The sort of well, the whole parenthood arc, I guess. It's like a lot of Russell T. Davis stuff doesn't seem to exist any further than the edges of the page on which it's being written. Yeah, and it's down that. to sort of the directors and the production to make it feel like it's real. And the actors, yeah. obviously, of course. And that usually does happen. And I guess we'll talk about it when we talk about a lot of the rest of the Russell T. Davis things. But he's forever throwing something in your line of view to distract you from the things that aren't working. So, for example, one thing that really, really, really really works and the first time the first time i saw this really sent the shivers down my spine and still did this time is the scene with the woman in the car who's looking for directions and then her eyes suddenly go yeah and as soon as her eyes go i i was like my blood ran cold the first time i watched it and still this time that still works and all of those scenes with all of those people because I don't believe in those characters one tiny little bit, frankly. But I think just that very subtle thing, well, it's not even that subtle, but subtle by comparison with some other things. I mean, it's not Al Pacino in The Devil's Advocate, for Christ's <laughs> sakes, or Robert De Niro in Angel Heart. It's not that. So, I mean, it's subtle compared to that. But I thought that really worked as a distraction technique at the very least. I also, I just think the effect is so good that they use on the eyes. It's not... You know, it's not like red eyes or something. It's just a weird little glint they put yeah, in their yeah. eyes and That's they're instantly point. someone else. Yeah, yeah. John, sorry, you said. No, no, yeah, no, no, it's, it's, it's a silvery thing. Yeah, it, it's not mm. an obvious choice. No, it's not. I, I don't know if that was in the script or if it's just in the performance, but it's perfectly done to unsettle because it's, it's kind of trying to be in that realistic genre and it's just enough. It's perfectly judged. I have a feeling, having watched this once with the commentary track on, that it was in the script. I'll tell you something that I seem to recall Davis saying in the commentary that I find a little harder to believe. Well, no, maybe not, knowing what he's like as a writer. He said, I'm sure he said he didn't know how he was going to finish it when he started writing it. 
Oh, wow. And yet that ending feels like such an obvious destination for Russell mm -hmm. T. Davis's version of the Son of God to go to. <laughs> it seems impossible that he couldn't know, but yeah. apparently he didn't. Yeah, th th there is another ending, but I think Paul Abbott said it would told him not to do it because it was cheating the audience, which was, I think, uh, Stephen ultimately ended up settling down uh, with uh, Leslie Sharp's character. Oh, good grief, really? Yeah. He Actually, gave, the, the, the ending's perfect. Not. Ending's perfect. Should have, should have left. Yeah. It ends the only way this story could have ended, I think. Yeah. I can't. You can't see how this story told by this writer could have ended yeah. in any other way. Or I think it's the... told by this writer there. Yeah, yeah. That's the important thing, told by this writer. Yeah, quite. I mean, the, the only other way would be a complete breakdown of society. <laughs> like, like, surely for 100%, like, a civil nuclear war, civil war, all of this, destruction of the planet. That, that's the only other way it could go with, like, an RTD script like this. <laughs> but also, <laughs> nihilistic yeah. about human nature. Yeah, yeah, I'm surprised he didn't, actually. <laughs> well, I mean... I, I don't think he could have written this story to end like that. But I do think that is the actual logical ending of this story. Yeah. Because let's face it, as soon as he does that first miracle, and that first miracle is a definitive proof that there is something about him, whether you believe it's because he's the son of God or not. Mm. But 50% of the people on this planet presumably would have looked at that and said, yeah, okay. And of all faiths, because you just look at it and you say, okay, the Christians are claiming him as theirs, but it, he... I mean, presumably the Hindus, the Sikhs, Muslims, whatever, would have claimed him as their own in some way, anyway. Um, you know, who, I don't know, but do you know what I mean? If you're of a mind to believe in a God, and if somebody comes along and says, I'm the son of God, and then does something that clearly could not have been done by mortal man, then at the end of, and I think this is the problem, the entire thing takes place in 48 hours, doesn't it? First episode's day one, second episode's day two. Basically, give or take, you know, give or take 40 days and 40 nights on Saddle with more. <laughs> yeah. But give or take that stuff, it basically takes place in about two days. Are you trying to kind of um, mirror the Easter weekend thing there, though? Because obviously, Jews fall down Good Friday and comes back on Easter Sunday. So is he trying to mirror that time scale, maybe? Presumably, but then that kind of cuts out the entire rest of the story. And I kind of understand why he cuts out the rest of the story, given what the destination's going to be. Because the whole idea of this version of the story is that it's not for God to say, it's for man to say. So the son of God isn't going to say either. Hence, there's no sort of meeting on the mount and there's no feeding of the 5,000 and there's no miracles. There's no miracles in this that actually benefit anybody because the only one that actually does benefit anybody in any way is the one where they walk out of the pub that's been blown up. But the only yeah. reason they're in the pub that gets blown up is because he put them there and he could have gotten them out of there before it blew up anyway if he'd have wanted to. So it's just kind of proven a point. But do you see what I mean? The idea that the Son of God doesn't do anything to benefit anybody because the message this time is that man needs to benefit himself that's a good idea that's a solid idea but i don't think the story justifies that idea but but he says it in his speech doesn't he and this is a reoccurring theme and he says you know you've become god so you're five years away from unraveling dna and mm. you know le when leslie sharp goes to the university she she says you know what why doesn't he solve poverty and the, the lady she speaks to is like well it, we could solve poverty or yeah yeah you know if, if we that's the to. best line in the whole thing actually yes yeah. but yeah but i see that and every now and again you've got great little pieces like that but that but the weird thing about it is those pieces seem to be bolted onto the story rather than fundamentally a part of it mm. do you know what i mean because he's telling this story about how man doesn't need religion but the fundamental problem is to tell this story about how man doesn't need to religion to doesn't need religion he has to put a religious figure an actual deity into the story yeah. which thus kind of undermines his own point if we can get along without religion then you should be writing a story in which there is no god not a story in which there definitively is one so he's kind of undermining his own point. Yeah, no, I, I, I'm not sure I agree with that. 
Yeah, fair enough. But I don't know. That was what I took away from it this time. Sorry, I think I spoke over John there. So. No, I'll, I'll just do a flippant John Lennon quote. <laughs> <laughs> you see what I mean? I don't. I think there's a story to be told, but I just think this story kind of muddles it. I, I think I, I think it's a good drama for its time. I think there's an interesting version of like Rusty Davis's Queer as Folk has been remade many times. I would love to see a long like a long series adaptation of this to really tell a, tell a story in which there are many more characters and perhaps Stephen Baxter or whoever the, the son of God is in that isn't the main, isn't the main yeah, character. Yeah. But I think there's a really interesting to be, you know, over six episodes a series for a couple of series. I think you could do something like truly, truly groundbreaking. But for its time, I feel like this, this, this was a groundbreaking and the a groundbreaking drama and possibly the most interesting way to tell this story at that point. I, I think yeah. we've set sus, uh, showed it on a Sunday as well. But yeah. well this episode anyway, that's quite fun. <laughs> provocative. Yeah. But it is provoc but it but it feels like it's being provocative for being provocative's sake, a lot of this. Because he because he doesn't he doesn't bring in any other opinions does he he doesn't bring in any other points of view it's like dylan was saying that priest who comes at the start of the story we needed to see more of him we needed yeah. to yes. but then i get there's like one quote from the bible or one quote from one book of the bible in the entire thing almost it almost feels like russell t davis is writing this follow-up to the bible but he's never actually read the bible and has no idea what's actually in the book or something and then kind of felt like that at points it, mm. it's sort of relationship to the bible is pretty superficial well, kind of yeah it does reduce it to you know old testament bad uh, new testament good and we need a third testament off that um and he doesn't really seem to understand what the word testament means <laughs> yeah but, no, but, no. <laughs> but I, th I think that's russell t davis has a very you know interesting and smart way of simplifying things because most of the people watching it won't know the difference between the New and the Old Testament or might have some vague recollections of it from Sunday school or or whatever. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I, I've got no religion in my upbringing at all, so I have no sort of referential points to the Bible whatsoever. So, I mean, I, I don't really know the difference between the Old and New Testament, so it works for me as, as a viewer in, in that respect. I think... And see, I don't have a huge amount, although, I, like John, I did Sunday school and stuff up to the age of whatever, 11 or something, I guess. But I think my point is, it felt like it was being written by somebody who'd never read the Bible, because it didn't feel like it was imbued with any of the stuff that made the Bible important to people. It didn't defer in any way. It, it was very reductive. It reduced it right down to Russell T. Davis's idea that God doesn't exist and it threw out everything else that didn't sort of join up with that idea and in throwing out all of that stuff it actually threw out the story that was based on that it was inspired by so I mean there's no getting away from it this is a sequel to the New Testament <laughs> that's what this is this is that's a that bold is... statement no but I mean that's what it is this is it, it there's no two ways about it. Whether whether you think it's a faithful or whatever, this does set itself up very ostentatiously as being a sequel to the New Testament. That is entirely what this story is. But it just it almost feels like it feels like somebody said to you as a filmmaker, "Oh, can you make the third Evil Dead film?" And you say, "Oh, I've not seen the first two. And they say, "Don't worry about it. Just do the third one." Well, it's it fine. The third, like the third Evil Dead I saw before the others anyway, and uh, it's, it's the best one, so it, it's fine. You don't but have you know to see I mean? the first two. At least two. the guy who made the first, <laughs> the third one had seen the first two, right? <laughs> <laughs> he knew what he was doing. Very true, very true. So do, do you have to have seen the first two, the, these Bibles one and two, before you watch The Second Coming? <laughs> no, but my point <laughs> is it didn't feel like Russell T. Davis had. Or I don't know. I just that was the impression I got. I, wonder, I just got the. I'd be interested to know what part religion played in Russell T. Davis's life as a child, because he's certainly of an age where you know I I would expect him to have probably gone to Sunday school or gone to church on a Sunday and stuff. And the idea you would of have thought so, yeah. It's difficult, yeah, because yeah, the eerie from is you know it's Swansea way, but that is a very kind of 
um, said Methodist, Baptist upbringing. The chapel was, you know, at a particular time he'd have been born. It might have been started changing. It's the centre, generally the centre of kind of the, the town life. Um, but he's he's very cynical about afterlives right through his, um, you know, right through his time. You go to Miracle Day of Torchwood, you go to, um, in fact, the first Torchwood episode, you know, it's yeah. where there's nothing. You know, you know, he's, he's very much um, a strong theme in his work of this is all we have, um, make the most of it. So, yeah. yeah. And I think I think that's a good theme, but I don't think the second coming addresses that theme thoroughly enough to convince me in its conclusions. Mm -hmm. Because I think I think it's important if you're going to come to a conclusion about something, I think it's important to examine the thing that you're making a conclusion about. And the second coming, like you said right at the start of our conversation, John, it's a polemic rather than an examination. So I don't think its conclusions are trustworthy, despite the fact that I agree with its conclusions. But I don't find its conclusions anything other than superficial. Yeah, and I, I, my, you know, it's a theory. I don't, I don't know Russ. I've met him a couple of times, but that's it. I haven't had any discussions. Obviously, it's. I kind of get the impression that it was that the eighties. You know, living through as a gay man in the eighties with that, with the with AIDS going around, everything, uh, particularly what we saw. With a slightly autobiographical, it's a sin. Um, that kind of thing, I think, would have completely turned him against any notion of an afterlife mm. or anything. Because, again, <laughs> who'd let this happen? Oh so yeah, my theory on it. But yeah, yes. but I think it doesn't let any other view in at that point. Someone, someone needs to write a silver archive on this and Russell T. Davis's relationship with religion. If only we knew somebody. <laughs> Matt, Matt could do it. <laughs> um, on the positive side, though, Leslie Sharp is really good, even if her character is not very likable, right? Yeah, again, it's a difficult, it's a difficult part to play because the character is fundamentally unlikable, and you're not meant to, I don't think, ever sympathise with her because she she has that that selfish core to her. So you know, she wants her friend here more than more than she wants a son of God around. Yeah, there is a problem with that. I mean, not a problem. I mean, it's in the characterization. It's a problem for the character in that she spent 25 years or something. I don't know quite how old they're supposed to be. 25 years not realizing that the thing she wants is right in front of her. Oh. And then it turns out he's the son of God anyway, right? No, no, no. She knows exactly what it is, but she was waiting for someone better, which is a cruel state. Oh, that, that, but that very it's, realistic. Yeah, it is, it is very realistic. And I think that Ross T. Davis does his characters are always cynical and selfish but i think perhaps if you're used to seeing them through the doctor who sort of viewfinder that we are that his version of a skewed selfish imperfect character in that world is jackie tyler whereas here we're going into a darker deeper sort of subject and so it suddenly becomes this leslie sharp character which because which just switches on an edge and becomes unlikable but but that's only because i think it, she hits so many home truths in a way. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but again, I'm not entirely sure that all of them really kind of add up. But then I guess when it comes to human beings, things don't add up, do they? So No, but uh, it's kind of a prototype of perhaps even Keely Hawes' character in its sin as well. Um, because he does have, as you see, the, 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 that, that kind of woman who is, I, I, I don't want to say it, but but shrewish in the sort that sense is the the character is has that kind of nagging thing to them, but kind of reducing everything around them, yeah, to how it affects them rather keeping than how it might keeping everyone's egos in check as well. Yeah, well, that yeah, because that is what Leslie Sharp's character is doing here, isn't it? It's just kind of is the story for her of what this means to her, how this affects her. And then I suppose that's why that revelation at the end, so I need to do this for the world, feels like, a, it, I mean, it's the logical place the story has to go, but at the same time, it just doesn't add up. It doesn't add up because why would it be she who makes that decision? And then why would the rest of the world take her decision at its word? So, yeah, it's a 
it's a really odd thing the second coming yeah. isn't it it's kind of two parts brilliant two parts mad two parts utterly frustrating yeah and it'll all get resolved in the third coming when uh <laughs> he's, he's finished on doctor who for the second time yeah maybe well then maybe the third coming is david tennant right <laughs> read him twice the first time around and here he is again <laughs> i mean there's bound to be sort of religious imagery if not religious allegory in these three episodes and in the shooty camera stuff because davis can't leave it alone can he yeah i mean what wasn't the regeneration on top of a cliff with the arms out sort of you know crucified mm. you, so it's already there and yeah and something like gridlock tells you he's, he's still aware of the power of faith somewhere yeah. Well, I mean, and look at it's a sin. It might be named after a Pet Shop Boys story, a uh, sort of story song, but it's still it is still using a religious icon in the three words of its name, isn't it? Yeah, it's not. It's wrong. It's it's a sin, mm. and that is still referring back to the Bible, isn't it? So he can't leave it alone, really. Right. Have either of you got anything more you want to add to this, or are we gonna? <laughs> Make some attempt at summing up and try and figure out a score. Mark, Mark Addy, maybe is mention him. And there's a oh, saint. Yeah. He's terrific, actually. Loved him. Yeah, I was really disappointed he didn't get a bigger part in Doctor Who because he could have been a terrific villain yeah. or a terrific sort of flawed side character who is responsible for something, but didn't happen, did it? He's back, he, he's back in Big Finish, don't worry. <laughs> he goes from Satan to Disciple, kind of, in, in, in Doctor Who terms on that first episode. Yeah. Uh, and he gets killed off way too early. Yeah, a bit sad. In fact, the whole, the whole storyline of the sort of Devil's Disciples is really interestingly played. And I like the scene, one of the good, really good scenes in it is the scene where they're talking... It's him, isn't it? Mark Benton talking to Leslie Sharp. And she says, well, you failed. And he says, no, we haven't failed because all we needed to do was line the dominoes up. It's for you to knock them over. And actually, in the end, she does. <laughs> so I don't know. It's it's weird and confusing, this. Dylan, give me your overall thought then and give it a score out of 10. Um, I, As I said, I much more enjoyed it coming back to this time. I think it's an interesting but flawed look at what you could do with the story of the second coming. I think there is a better story to tell and somebody will tell that story one day. Um, but I'll give it a 7 out of 10. I thought it was a compelling drama that had me hooked all the way through. Mm. I See, I could have given this a 9 out of 10 because it hooks you in and keeps you engaged. But then in the last couple of days, thinking about it, I'm like so irritated by it. I wanted to give it like a four out of 10 or something. <laughs> and I think probably it probably deserves an eight out of 10. But I'm giving it seven, too, because it irritated me too much for me to go with an eight. <laughs> but, yeah, I kind of all the thing, all the other things you said. Yeah, I agree with those. It's there's a lot of good stuff, but all that good stuff is just slightly out of your field of vision. Yeah. John, just make it slightly off your average and go. I I will say in it because it is just a really well made for the time piece of drama. Um, you know, I I watch Benton, Mark Benton. I watch uh, Leslie Sh Leslie Sharp. You watch Eccles, and I just think it, the cast. I would I would you know happily take another hour of that. Um, <laughs> even if it's just them the domestic point the domestics of it all. Yeah. Um. Yeah, it, I, I just I agree on everything. I think if it just had a little more room to breathe, it could have been really good. Even if it is a polemic, again, it's compelling. It's a, it's a, you know, it's almost the power of propaganda to a certain degree. But it's, you know, the weird thing about it is, it is a polemic, and it's a polemic about religion. And if you're going to make a polemic about religion, you need to show the things that religion does to people to make them behave in reprehensible ways to show why the things that religion gets wrong so you could show the things that religion gets right you can throw the things that religion gets wrong but the thing is it takes two and a half hours and it doesn't show you anything about religion so it's a polemic yeah. about something that it doesn't illustrate 
do you, do you know what's interesting as well? I know we're wrapping things up, but this is obviously the same, this is the same time as the God Delusion. And I remember picking up the God Delusion and thinking, this is going to prove that God doesn't exist. But it just went, look at all these stupid religion pe- religious people and the stupid yeah. things they've done. Ha, ha, ha. And weirdly, you want some of those things sort of thrown in, but the good and the bad things that religious people have done in order to try and sell this story and this polemic more, don't you? But instead, there's none of that there. The religious the religious fact of it and the religious matter is strangely missing from, from the, the, the overall story. Yeah, it's such a weird way of doing it, I think. But yeah. But we'll be back in a couple of weeks to talk more Russell T. Davis. I don't know what the team will be for that. I don't know if it'll necessarily be the same three of us, maybe with or without other people as well. But we're definitely going to be talking a lot more Russell T. Davis before we get Ten- David Tennant back on our screens. Until we do that, I hope you enjoyed your 30 minutes, kids. <laughs> we're now up to 57 i'm looking at the clock <laughs> we will speak again soon oh no i was jr i was dylan and i was john <laughs> and we will speak again soon <laughs>